Lord for his sacrifice. Um, the Children's Church is going to do a presentation, an Easter presentation for you guys. We are so excited for them. They learn scriptures about Easter, so they're going to rehearse and say those scriptures for you. They're going to open us up in prayer first. Then somebody's going to do a mini message, and then, the, then they're going to sing a song for you. So let's encourage our kids. We are so excited for what they learn. We thank God for them. So at this time, Virgil is going to instruct us on what to do. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Oh, Lord, you love this world so much that you gave your one and only son that we might be called your children too. Lord, help us live in gladness and grace of Easter Sunday every day. Lord, help, let us have hearts that look upon your grace and rejoice Amen. All right, let's give God some praise. Let's give God some praise. Come on up, CJ. Good morning, everyone. My name is CJ, and I'm going to be saying John 3.16 in my Easter speech. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16, the great love of God to all the unlovable sinners, the righteous work of Christ for the unrighteous, the bright call of the gospel to those who sit in darkness. Have you ever wondered why we can trust what Jesus said and did throughout his ministry as good, true, and beautiful? How do we know it isn't all made up? We can trust these things for one reason, the very reason we gathered together for worship this morning, because of the resurrection. God intends for us to see this, the huge sacrifice that he did. If you still have unbelief, that is the beginning of eternal suffering in hell. While the end of belief is the beginning of pleasure forevermore in heaven, he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given confidence to all by raising Jesus from the dead. That is why we celebrate Resurrection Day, for the sacrifice that he did for us all. Because of his love and free gift of salvation, will we receive his love today? Happy Resurrection Day! Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm gonna read um, First Peter, first chapter, third verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Right. Genesis. Now, mind you, these kids have learned these scriptures, okay? Hi, my name is Genesis. I'm going to be saying Romans 5 to 8. But God commanded his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Six through seven. 
and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye shall not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. I said they learned their scriptures. <laughs> Come on, Aiden. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Aiden Clarence Moran, and today I'm going to read my scripture, Romans 6 to 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we shall walk into the newness of life. They learn their scriptures, okay? And at this time, we're going to have the kids come up. I'm going to place them up here. We're going to need a little help up here because they're going to sing y'all a song. All right.
Didn't they do a good job? Hey man, hey man, our future choir, our new praise team leader. Hallelujah. Yeah, I might get a rest after all. <laughs> Hallelujah. We bless your name, oh God.
We come to thank him for all that he has done. For he didn't have to do it. Where would we be if it had not been for the Lord on our side? Where would we be? What would we be doing if God had not intervened for you? If he had not intervened for me? I'd be a mess. I don't know where you would be. I'd probably be locked up. Because I know how I was. But he came and he changed my life. Hallelujah. Thank God for his changes. You thought I was worth saving. So you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping. So you clean me up inside. You thought I was the death for. So you sacrificed your life so I can.
like no other. Peace like no other. And it reaches. You are my hope. Hope like no other. as we declare God's blessings over our life once again through our confession. Father, I thank you that I know the season that I'm operating in. Your perfect timing. I know your will for my life and I will under the circumstances, people or things I see happen around me. Move me out of my season or rob me of my harvest. Father, I'm committed to prayer, studying your word and walking in obedience. I know your voice and the voice of a stranger I will not follow. I hear your voice say, this is the way, walk ye in it. I would not miss out on my harvest, nor will I fail to accomplish your plan and your purpose for my life. In fact, I will not quit, therefore I cannot, and I will not be defeated. I will let patience have a perfect work in me, if I am confident that I will endure until the end and enjoy the reward of my harvest. Let's give him a vation praise again if you love him. Amen. You may take your seats if you can. Thank God for you being here this resurrection uh, Sunday morning, the day we uh, observe and honor Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Take, tell your neighbor, say, if he hadn't risen, our faith would be in vain. Amen. Give him another praise if you love upon him. Let's open up by starting to read in the book of St. Matthew. St. Matthew is the 28th chapter, verse uh, 1 through 8. And, and, and tonight, today, my, my subject that I'm, a min, I'm going to minister you on, or at least believe God to do so, is, is, is comfort from the empty tomb. Tell your neighbor, said, we receive comfort from Jesus' empty tomb. Comfort from the empty tomb. Matthew 28, verse 1. It says, now on the Sabbath, near the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and other Mary went and took, uh, uh, to, went, went to look at the tomb, talking about the tomb that Jesus was in. And behold, there was a great earthquake, 
for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the boulder that in, and set upon it. His appearance was like lightning. His garment was white as snow. And those gardening, I mean, those guarding the tomb were frightened at the sight of him, that they were agitated and trembled and became like dead men. Tell somebody, I said they were scared. They were scared. But the angel said to the women, do not be alarmed, frightened, for I know that you came looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he is not here. He has risen as he said he would do. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly to his disciples. And, and, and it says, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you in, in Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I've told you. And they left the tomb hastily and, and with fear and with great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Tell your neighbor says, even though there was fear. There's great comfort in the empty tomb. Now, this was the greatest miracle probably for mankind, especially for the great church. There's no other, there's no other uh, 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 incident that ever happened in the Bible that is as great as this story we just read about than the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, as far as we know, it's, 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 it's historical fact that, you know, and that has great and profound implications. If Jesus can arise from the dead, tell them said, we can too. Now, the thing I want you to understand is even though the tomb or funerals tend to be uh, 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 incidents of, of solemn or sad uh, uh, experiences, this particular incident that was, was, a, was an occasion of great joy because Jesus had made promises. So there's actually, I'm going to point out, five different messages that we get from the empty tomb. Five different things the empty tomb says us. I'm ready for my message. First of all, the first message was Jesus is no longer there. He arose. He arose from the dead. He was, the Bible called him the first fruits of the, of, the, of, the, of the new creature, which means he set the example about what we're going to have the power to do. In fact, let's read in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews the seventh chapter, verse uh, uh, 25, and it says this. Therefore, he, meaning Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost, completely, perfectly, Finally, for all eternity, those who come to God through him, since he is always living and making petition to God and in see, interceding with God and in, in, in intervening in behalf of him. It says he sits at the father's right hand and intercedes on our behalf. Hebrews 7, 25, because Jesus rose from the dead. We can rest and be assured that knowing that all the struggles, we, I, I preached last week about drinking your salvation cup. We can, we, can be a, uh, we can be encouraged that all we go through is going to be worth it. Tell your neighbor, I don't know about you. So it gets hard sometimes, but I believe it's going to be worth it. Second thing is there is death after life. Now, a lot of times people are afraid of death and afraid to talk about dying because they don't know what's next. You know, I, I, we know what the Bible says. We know what people think, but they really don't know. No, no other, nobody other than Jesus has went there and came back and told us about it. So you got to accept the word of Jesus. But, but, but what it does do is give us hope that there is a, a, some life after death. This is not it. The life we have on this earth, the scripture uh, promised us, uh, I think it's three score and, and ten, which is seven years. And if you live past 70 years, you own grace. I mean, you, you, you being blessed. That's what the Bible says mankind. Ago. But the thing about it is this life is, is, is fleeting. It's fading. It's going away whether we realize or not. But there is another life to come. There is life after this. Tell me, there is life after this. Go to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 27. In the King James Version, it says this. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after that, the judgment in the message the Bible says everyone has to die once, then face the consequences. Christ's death was a one time event, but it was a sacrifice that took care of sins forever. Because of Jesus resurrection, we know that there is a world beyond the grave. There's hope and, and, and you know, and, and we can have a joyous expectation of the next life. I, I don't know about you, if you gave your life to the Lord, you don't need to worry about what's going to happen when you get there. Tell me you don't need to worry about that. 
I, I don't know. I, uh, people always talk about how you're going to, all the questions you're going to ask Jesus when you see him. The song, you, I, I don't know what you're going to do. I just know when you get there, you'll be glad you made it. Tell you, let me see, you just be glad you made it. Give him praise again if you love him. All of us have got to give account of the life we spend here on earth. You have a life, you feel it's your own, but in reality, it's borrowed. Because Jesus bought it. The Bible said Jesus' death paid the price for our salvation. So, you know, God is going to hold us accountable for what we do with this life. That's why you got to find your place. You got you to find your calling. You got to find what God has put you on planet Earth to do. Whether you're in the church, whether you consider yourself a Christian, whether you've been born again, whether you've spoken tongues, all like, or whether you've been baptized, all those things are mute point to the fact that you belong to God regardless of what you do. He said, behold, all souls are mine, but the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So that's why as a, as, as a believer, I need to understand the significance of what Resurrection Day and Easter is all about. It gave me an opportunity to live again, not just this time, but to be able to live again. Say, so this gives us the opportunity to know we can live again. Your life on earth is like a grain of sand, you know, in comparison to how long it's going to be with the Lord. You know, I, I, you have to ask yourself, are you using this lifetime that you have to prepare for the next one? I, I mean, you may be traveling, you may have money, you may have a nice home, you can have a nice car, nice career, family may be doing good. But are you using the things of this life to prepare you for the next one to come? Tell your neighbor, say, because it's coming. You need to understand that whether we are Christians or not, the next life is coming. It doesn't matter when we get there, we'll be rejoicing or we'll be wishing we could run when there won't be no place to run. The third thing is Christ's anointing, atoning sacrifice for our sin. The empty tomb tells us it was accepted. The fact that Jesus got up from the dead says that God accepted his sacrifice. That's the evidence that Jesus dying for us on the cross was efficient. Give him praise again if you love him. The evidence... That the resurrection of, of Jesus worked for us is the fact he got up out of the grave. You know, but before we receive the gift of salvation, sin separated us from God. You know, and, and, and you know, thank God for you all in here. But you know, a lot of times people think because they attend church or because they're a member of a church or because they got baptized, that, that means that they're a child of God. Well, uh, the Bible did say all souls are mine, but God's children, those who he's going to embrace, is going to only be those who have received the gift of salvation. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to be in a certain denomination to get it. It's a free gift to everybody that will say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I, I, I believe I, I ask you to for, I, I believe Jesus died and rose. I accept his death as payment for my sins. Forgive me and come into my house and into my heart. Before we accept God's gift of salvation, sin separates us from God. Do you realize before you come to the church, I don't want to use the word church, before you come to salvation, give your life to the Lord. Before you give your life to the Lord, the prayers you pray don't get answered the way you think they do. Because the Bible says in the book of St. John, around the uh, uh, 30th chapter, it, it says, if a man is a worship of God and does God's will, God hears him. But if a person is not a worship of God and then they'll come to God, the Bible said God does not hear sinners' prayers. The only prayer God hears or is listening to, not he's God, he, he hears everything, but the only thing he's acknowledging. It's the prayer coming from somebody that has accepted him as their savior and as their Lord. That individual, his ears are always open to your prayers. But until you get to that point, see, you know, the Bible says we're all born in sin. Everybody, you, you know, you're not a sinner because you do wrong. You're not a sinner because you lie, because you steal, because you fornicate, because you commit adultery, because you use drugs, because you're a pedophile, because you're homosexual. But you know, none of that stuff makes you sin. Those things are, are not things you should be doing if you gave your life to the Lord. But, the, but acts of, of sin does not make us sinners. And that's the way religion has taught us in the past, as you're a sinner because you do this, you do that. No, no, you're not a sinner because you do sin. Sin is a nature that we're all born with when we give our life, you know, when we came into planet Earth. It came not from Adam and Eve, it contaminated our gene pool. So everybody is a sinner when they're born. Even the cute little babies that everybody want to kiss on, everybody hug, you know, you, you kiss them on a little, little heathen, a little sinner. Now I know, I, I, you know, I, I know we don't see it that way. You say, Pastor, you ain't said it about me. We are, the Bible said we are all born in sin. 
and shapen, which means grow up from the beginning in iniquity, which is sin again. So everybody has a sin nature. The thing that changes us is when we come to the Lord and we say, God, I recognize that I'm a sinner by nature. I want to change. Forgive me of my sins. See, see, in the Bible days, they used to sacrifice goats, and cows and calves and sheep and those kind of things for sin. But in this day and age, the Bible said, but they had to do that every year. Every year they had to go to the high priest and they brought all these animals and, and, and the priest had to go in there and sacrifice for everybody's sin. Now to show how, all, how, 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 how uh, monumental job that was, the children of Israel alone, uh, when they left out of uh, Egypt under, uh, uh, under Pharaoh, had about four million plus men, plus women and children. So the priests had to sacrifice for every last one of those men, women, and children. And they didn't just sacrifice one sack. It depended on how much sin they had. The Bible even told them if you did this, you sacrifice this. If you did that, you sacrifice the other. So they had to do all these sacrifices every year. So think about how monumental the task was just to get the sin forgiven for a year. And they won't have to come back again another year. Jesus died one time, once and for all, for everybody's sin. That is what resurrection is all about. He died one time. And what does that mean? If I give my life to the Lord, I accept in my heart, I'm no longer a sinner in the eyes of God. Now, I may still do something, something sinful, and I need to ask God for forgiveness of my sinful act. But my sinful act does not make me a sinner again. It might cause me to have some broken fellowship. It might cause me to, to feel my prayers and get answered. But all I need to do is come before him boldly and ask for forgiveness. And once again, I'm back in right relationship with him. What I do now is when I go to him forgiveness, I don't have to take him a goat. I don't have to take him a lamb. I just remind him the blood is on me. I remind him I, I gave my life to the Lord. And so when you give your life to the Lord, symbolically, God, the blood of Jesus covers you, covers your soul. You don't see it. You don't feel it. But it does it in the eyes of God. So when I go back before God and ask for forgiveness, I don't need a new sacrifice because this one sacrifice Jesus was supposed to be for all times. So it was a one time deal. Give him praise if you love him. <laughs> praise him again. Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verse 18 says this. But all things are from God. And I'm reading Amplified Classic Version of the Bible. Who through Jesus Christ reconciled, which is a brought us back in right relationship, to himself. Received us into favor. Brought us in harmony with himself. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation, which means when I give my life to the Lord, my, my part of my time here on earth is to be trying to encourage other people to give their lives to the Lord. If I'm not being evangelistic, if I'm not sharing my faith, if I'm not trying to bring somebody into what I mean, then I'm not fulfilling my assignment for why God left me on earth a little bit longer. The Bible says he has given us the ministry of reconciliation that by our words and by our deeds, we might aim to bring others into harmony with God. He says it was God. Pay attention. It was God personally present in Christ when Jesus died on the cross. Even though the flesh that people saw was the son of God, God himself was down here on earth in the in, inside the, the suit of Jesus, the body of Jesus, seeing what mankind was like and experiencing mankind. In the Old Testament, when, 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 a, when a person violated the law of God, in many instances, God killed them on the spot or they were or, or he commanded the children of Israel to stone those people to death. But we have a different kind of savior. The Bible says he reconciled or brought us back into right relationship with now. Compassion is what we meet when we go when we go him about our shortcomings. Our sins. Let me read it again. He said God was personally present himself in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world into favor with himself, not counting up and holding against mankind their trespasses or their sins, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation and restoration of faith, which means he canceled our sins. Now he wants us to go tell somebody else that God will counsel theirs as well. So we are Christ ambassadors. God making his appeal, as it were, through us. We are Christ's personal representatives. We beg you for his sake, lay hold to God's divine favor that's now being offered to you and be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for our sake, 
Jesus was made virtually to be sin who knew no sin so that through him you know, uh, we might become endued and viewed as being examples of righteousness. So how do we become righteous? Not by doing good deeds. Because see, the church sometimes misleads you thinking you being righteous because you're good. And the Bible says all our good is as filthy rags before the Lord. We become good because we submitted our lives to Jesus. And now once we submit it, we allow him to live out through our lives by leading us to what we should or should not do. He said we should become examples of the righteousness of God, that we ought to be approved and accepted in right relationship with him by his goodness. The empty tomb, because we gave our lives to the Lord, when we repent, gives us confidence that God answers our prayers and that Jesus can do something. About it. Say God doesn't just answer. He can do something about it. Jesus even predicted the fact that he was going to rise from the dead. And the empty tomb shows that the father accepted his sacrifice and restored us in the right relationship. Every believer is going to experience resurrection. Now, I, I told you the empty tomb says some things. And what it says is, it, it, since Jesus arose, he left instructions telling us we're going to have to rise as well. Every believer is going to experience resurrection. Say, say I, I don't want to miss out on my part. The old school preachers used to say, I, I got my ticket, you know, <laughs> I'm a, like you had to get, you know, getting on a train or something. But every believer is going to experience a resurrection. Now, I want you to understand uh, uh, that when we, arrive, when we arise from the dead, we will not be spirits. See, religiously, people think you're going to be a ghost, you know, because you died, you took off the body. So when I come back, I'm going to be a ghost floating around like the stuff y'all see on sci-fi on TV. We will not be spirits when we come back. Those that arise from the dead will not be spirits. They're going to have bodies. Not bodies like we have, but they will be bodies. Let's find this in the word of God. In the book of St. Luke, the 24th chapter, you know, Jesus, when he came back, was not a ghost. He was not a spirit. The Bible says in Luke 24, 39, when the disciples saw him, they thought he was a spirit. And, you know, and he told them to look at the scars of my hand and touch, put your hand in my side and see where, where the appearance of the spirit. And the King James Version says, verse 37 of Luke 24, but they were terrified when they saw Jesus. Remember the lady, the angel told Jesus, told uh, the men, women, go tell the apostles he's on his way. He's coming. You know, her, they said, her and go tell them. Why? Because they wanted the women to get there before Jesus got there. She said, hastily go tell apostles he's on his way. So, but when Jesus came and, and knocked on the door, they didn't believe it was Jesus. In fact, one case, he didn't knock on the door. He just appeared in the room. Now, nobody in here, and I, I know y'all watch sci-fi, and y'all got, uh, uh, what, what do you call it, the, uh, uh, God, uh, 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 transporters on Star Trek and uh, the old school, you know, where, where they just go from one place to another. Well, and I, I, I don't know about the transporter, but Jesus appeared in a room that was locked because the apostles were scared they were next. So there was hid, hiding in his room, and Jesus appeared in the room where it was locked. He says, and they were terrified, they were frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. They said, well, look, we know Jesus died. This must be his ghost. You know, it had to be a whole lot of black folk in there, because you know how y'all is about spirits and stuff. <laughs> Either, but, but, but they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why are your thoughts of your heart so? Behold, look at my hands. Behold, touch my feet. It is I. Handle me. Touch me. You can't touch a spirit. You can't touch a ghost. He says, handle me. See, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see me have. This was after his resurrection. He appeared without the door being unlocked or open in the room. But he was not a ghost because they could touch him and handle him. And another uh, 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 scripture passage said he asked them, do you have anything to eat? And he sat there and ate locusts and wild honey. A spirit can't eat unless y'all watching Ghostbusters. You know, them spirits in that. You, know, you, you, need, you, you need to understand when we come back, we're not going to be ghosts floating around anywhere. We're going to have bodies that can touch, that can feel, that people can touch us. And, and, and that's all because 
of what Jesus did in the resurrection. Now, I don't know how things was before the resurrection. Maybe there were spirits and ghosts and things, the few that you did see. Uh, remember the scripture declared there was a time where Jesus was praying and, and, and he was having a great uh, a challenge. And the Bible said Moses, the spirit of Moses and Elijah appeared there with him. And the apostle says, you know, do we need to make three tabernacles? And, 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 and when, he, when they said that, Moses and Elijah disappeared. Jesus is the only one uh, left. And, the, and God said, this is my beloved son. Hear ye him. So, you know, there were times spirits appeared. But for the New Testament Christian, for you all that have accepted Jesus and understand what the resurrection is all about, you are not going to come back as a ghost. So that means you, you, your, your, your kinfolk that died in the Lord and, and you think Aunt Mary came and, and, and to talk to you because you're about to make a bad decision. You, know, you, you understand this. You ain't coming back until Jesus come back. All that other stuff y'all see and y'all talking to when y'all go to uh, Mother Mary to Palm Reed and other, that is not God. That, that is not the spirit of the Lord. Those are demonic influences. Even if they're saying what you want to hear and you got to understand that's just not the way God does stuff. Tell you, say that ain't the way God does stuff. Give him praise again if you love him. Oh, some of y'all been going to Mother Mary to go get your money back. Ah, now go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Christ's resurrection was our foretaste. And what it means, it was a sample of what we can look for. Our bodies are going to be renewed and they're going to be perfectly fit to survive heaven. Because, like, like I said, when Jesus came back, he didn't need to open doors. He could just appear there. When he finished talking to them, he didn't walk out the door. He vanished. But he wasn't a spirit. And so we're going to have powers and, and giftings and be able to do things once we get transformed in our bodies that our natural human body could never even dream of or fathom they could be able to do. I want you to understand there's some good stuff we haven't even tapped in on that God's going to do because of the resurrection. Because the tomb was empty, that means there's some good things coming down the road. Say so, so the empty tomb, release some good stuff. Our bodies are going to be renewed. And they're going to be the kind of body that can live eternally. There will be no more sickness, no more dying, no more getting old. I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to be, but I don't believe we, when we come back, we're going to be like we was when we left. You know, because some of y'all got bunions where you, you can't have wear shoes. You know, uh, you, know you, you got you, you know, some, some people overweight, some people underweight. You know, some people lost a hair and they're they trying to glue some back, back on. I mean, uh, you, you know, some people eyes bad. Some, I mean, I, I, don't, well, I believe when we come back, we're going to be perfect. I, I, if, if, I could, if I could recognize you when you got to heaven, I believe I would see you and I wouldn't know who you was. And, and, and then when you told me, I said, child, look at you. Man, salvation be good to you. I believe in my heart when God transformed us, everything about us is going to be perfect. I don't believe we're going to all look identically the same. But I believe just like we have a unique uh, 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 gifts and abilities in the Lord on this side, I believe we're going to have uniqueness on the other side as well, but we're going to be perfect. Tell your neighbor, I'm looking for that perfection. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more hurts, no nothing to ever fear again. That's what the empty tomb released for you. But you got to embrace it. And, uh, uh, and 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, uh, verse 16, it says this in the King James Version. For if the dead rise not, then, then uh, uh, excuse, me, if, excuse me, if the dead rise not, then Christ didn't arise. Verse 17. And if Christ did not arise, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. Then they which have fallen asleep, those who have, uh, 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 have died. Uh, 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 in Christ would perish. He said, if Jesus didn't rise and you die, you're gone. Tell them, say, 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 but we arose. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all most miserable men. He said, if the only thing you got is a memory of what Christ did here on earth, then you need to be miserable. You should be miserable. T tell them, but say, but that's not the way it is. Just as a farmer plants the seed and expects a harvest in due time, our bodies will not be forgotten in the grave. God will raise them up and on, the, and on the day uh, 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 with absolute perfection in one day. We'll be the fullness of Jesus here on earth. Look at 1 John, the third chapter, verse 1. It says this, King James Version. Behold, what man of love the Father has bestowed or put upon us, that we should be called 
the sons or daughters of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it didn't know him. It says, verse two, beloved. Now we are the sons of God and it does not yet appear what we shall be. Talking about when we, when, when we arise from the dead, when he comes back. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Whatever way Jesus was, when he appeared before those disciples, it's how you're going to be when he brings you back. Or, in fact, I say bring it back. Everybody want me gone. You know, the, the way the world is going on, the way morals are now, the way, the way uh, yeah, different things. I, I believe some of us might still be alive when the rapture or, or, or the second coming of Christ comes. So that means, but whatever, wh whether you go on and sleep through death or whether you still look up in the sky when he parts it, whatever it is, we're going to be changed. The Bible says in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, he says this body is going to take off its mortality and put on immortality. You now this perishable is going to take off perishable and put on non-perishable, which means you're going to put on the same type of glorified body, is what I call it, that Jesus had. So don't fear death. The Bible says, you know, we ought not to sorrow as the world sorrows, that it has no hope. But we need to realize there is a next part. You might have loved ones that, that went to sleep or died and went on before you, but, no, but, but don't, don't sorrow for that. I, I, know you, I know you hurt for the loss of separation, but they made it to where you're trying to go. If they're in the Lord when they die, they've already, they, they have finished their labors. I, I don't know uh, if they're able to look down and see what the stuff you're going through and, and there's hope you can make. I don't know how that works, but I do know they, they don't have to struggle anymore with, against sin, against Satan, against just the issues of just being a, a human in the flesh. They've made it over. You can have that same hope. He says, it does not yet appear what we'll be, but when it appears, we're going to be like him. In fact, St. John, the 14th chapter, verse 2 says this, in my father's house, there are many mansions. When Jesus says mansions, I hope you don't think he's up there with brick, mortar. You can say, well, I want my house to be stucco. Somebody said, no, I want mine to be stone. I, when he says in my father's house are many mansions, I hope you don't think he's talking about literal homes. The mansions is talking about your glorified body what you're going to live in when you be with Jesus. He says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. He says, if it was not so, I would not have told you. He said, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you into myself that where I am, you may be also. So what must you do to be able to be a part of the kingdom of God, to have this glorified body and to be able to be in heaven? The, uh, of the heavenly place. And the reason why I had to clarify and say heavenly place is y'all do understand, even though all our church life, most folk told you you're going to die and go to heaven. No, none of us is going to heaven. You know, you do know that, don't you? I, I know they tell you that in church. You, you're going to die. You're going to heaven. No, you ain't going to heaven. The Bible says New Jerusalem, which is heaven, is going to come down here to earth. And we're going to be forever with the Lord here on earth once this system and, and, the, and this order and these people have been removed. God's going to renovate the earth. So we're going to live forever rejoicing in the Lord on earth, not in heaven. Those have, that have died and gone be with the Lord before New Jerusalem come, before God, the end time comes. Now, they may be in a portion of heaven waiting on us. The Bible refers to that as under the altar of God. But we, you understand, we are not going. If, 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 if the Lord does not spare us coming, we are not going to heaven. Heaven is coming to us. Say, 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 say it's been special delivered. Get, get, you know, you, you got grab bag and, and uh, uh, what's the rest of those things with home delivery and stuff. And, uh, 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 you know, I don't use it because I even can't say the name of it. <laughs> but, 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 but we, we won't have to worry about, we don't have to worry about that kind of thing because God's going to bring heaven to earth. And so, so my question was, so what do you need to do to be a part of that? In St. John, the third chapter, verse one, the Bible says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews that came to Jesus by night and said, and Rabbi, we know that a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. And another portion he asked them, well, you know, what, what must I do in eternal, uh, uh, to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answered and said unto him, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The Bible said, if we don't give our lives to the Lord, we don't become born again, new creatures. He said, not only we not go, go there, you ain't going to see it. You will not see the kingdom of God. 
He says, believe on Jesus Christ. You got to believe on the atoning sacrifice of Jesus uh, uh, birth. And John 3, 6, 6, 6, 3, 16 said, for God so loved the world, you know, they gave his only begotten son who will believe him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10 verse 9 says this, that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you shall believe with your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what do I need to be a part of it? Recognize that I'm born in sin regardless of how good I am. Then just ask God forgiveness based on the fact that Jesus died to pay for your forgiveness. Receive it by faith. Just say, well, Lord, forgive me. Come into my heart. You don't have to be running around the church. And you don't have to be rolling on the floor. You don't have to be jumping benches. You just need to open your heart up sincerely and invite him in. Now, that's not the end of the matter. You also need to be filled with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. Because you understand this. Being saved, salvation is about Sin being taken away from you, the blood of Jesus, uh, the water of you, the Bible said through baptism, you know, we are saved. So symbolically in the eyes of God, you are saved when you become, when you, when you, when you surrender your sins, uh, when you ask God to forgive your sins and come to your life and you're baptized, you're saved. But you don't have the spirit of God living in you yet. All it did was clean up your house. It renovated your body so it could come in and live. It hadn't come in and lived. It, it, it's kind of like, for instance, if you ever bought a house or been in the house somebody just moved out of and it wasn't going up for sale, you know, you, it just had to be evicted. You know, it, well, you know, you, you'd have to do some major cleaning up in that house and overhaul before it was comfortable for you to move in unless you were just like them. But, but if, if you ain't, if, you know, <laughs> you, you have to do some major cleaning up, some painting, some new carpet, and maybe some new fixtures, you know, because you've been renovated. Well, you got to understand, when, when, when we ask God to forgive us and come in our heart, we are renovated from the inside out, but we empty. Nothing's living in us yet. So I gotta invite the Holy Ghost into me. And when it comes, it announces itself. Most of the time, people that receive the Holy Spirit begin to speak in other tongues, or an unknown tongue. You know, but, but you gotta understand, the Holy Ghost needs to be invited in. It won't come automatically. You need to ask it to come in. Ask, the Bible says God will give the Holy Spirit to many of those that ask him. You gotta ask him for it. When it comes in, don't look to act like somebody else you saw acted when they received it. If you've been in other denominations, especially the Pentecostal church and some of the full gospel churches, when people uh, 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 receive the Holy Ghost, a lot of times they're speaking in tongues, they're running around, they're jerking, they're rolling, doing all these things. Now, when you give your life to the Lord because you haven't been exposed to that environment, that might not be how your experience is. You, know, you might be just sitting there calm. And the Holy Ghost just overshadow you all over, making you feel you know, the greatest joy of a fear from, from head to toe. It might begin to speak. You might have a, a real melodious voice coming out. I mean, just so, so soft. You, you might not be a uh, holly like, ah, I mean, I can, blah, blah, blah. you know what I mean? You may doing all that. Because, you know, it, it, that's, that's not your exposure. And, and that's not how God uses you. Understand when God fills you with the Holy Spirit from, as a reward from Jesus dying and resurrection, it's going to be tailor-made. It'll be nothing to fear. You know, it, it, it'll be nothing to be intimidated by. You know, don't, don't allow other people to intimidate you and make you think you don't have it because you don't act like them. Amen. When I was first coming up in the Lord and, and, and back then when I gave my life to the Lord, they used to do what was called tearing. Which they got down on the altar. Uh, we don't even have altars now in the Eastern Jersey. You got, got on the altar in front, in, in front of the pulpit and they got down on their knees and they clapped their hands real fast. And Jesus, 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 Jesus. That, that was what they called terror. Now, why, why that was terror? That's just what they called terror. And, and, you know, and they took that from the Bible where the Bible says they, in, 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 in uh, Acts, where it said they tarried so many days for the Holy Ghost. So they took that to mean calling the name of Jesus was terror. But terror just mean wait. All that means is you waited in the presence of the Lord until you were filled. Now, we did that, and, and, and sometimes people spoke in tongues, but they didn't speak in tongues the way them folk over you were, that were telling you the tarot was spoke. So they said, well, you almost got it now. You get, you're getting it, but just keep on. You say, you know, the Lord, Lord bless you sooner or later. So you would, I know when people been there for months, every Sunday on the altar, calling on Jesus. You call them until you sweat, or cold, or wet, or sweat. Folk make up, running on the face, hair was you know, uh, uh, plastered on the head. I mean, you know, uh, foam was coming out your mouth. And they say, oh, you getting there now? No. <laughs> but that is nothing you need to be afraid of. The Holy Ghost, I believe in my heart and mind that God is a gentleman. And I believe, and, and I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not going off or speaking bad of their experience. 
So don't think I'm, I'm picking at or, or, or demoting their experience. What I am saying is your experience will be unique. It'll be tailor-made for your faith. If that's what you need now, you're going to roll on the floor. If, if that's what you're expecting, you know, you're going to be doing all kinds of crazy things. But it won't be because God demanded it. It'll be because that was the only way he's going to let you know you got it. Grandmama told you when you got it, you're going to roll on the floor. So, you, you, I mean, grandmama been gone 40 years, and, but you ain't got it. So now you expect them to still roll. So the Lord going to let you roll. Give him praise if you love him. In conclusion, if Jesus didn't arise from the dead, our faith would be dead. But our Savior did triumph over death. And because he did, he's going to prepare a place for us. Because of the resurrection, I can have confidence that everything Jesus promised is coming to pass. But can you participate in it? Now, if you never gave your life to the Lord, everything I said about the death of Jesus is just being wasted. Because everybody, like I said, everybody, I, I heard some people say, well, Pastor, I don't believe God's going to let people go to hell, you know, because we all his children and hear God of love. Well, he, he said in the scripture, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And it said the only way we could have a part with him is if we accepted the payment of our sin for salvation. If I choose to reject God, God won't send me to hell. My lifestyle consequences will dictate my path because I didn't choose my get out of jail card. I didn't choose what I needed to be with him. He's told us what it takes. So three things. I mean, I, I, right now, I should stand TV. Stand TV. There's four things we often ask in this ministry when it comes down to salvation. Number one is, do you need to give your life to the Lord? Remember, even if you go to church, even if you've been in a church all your life, if you never pointed, let's say, at Lord and acknowledge, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Come into my heart. I believe Jesus died on the cross for me and that he arose from the dead. And I accept his gift it's paid with my sins. Reconnect me. Re, re, reconcile me in relationship with you. If you do that instantaneously, you become a part of the family of God. Now, you still need to get baptized with the Holy Ghost, but that's not a hard thing to do. So the second thing is if you gave your life to the Lord, you know, but, but you, know, you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, then all you got to do is invite me. in. If you're in this congregation here now and you want to give your life to the Lord, or you gave your life to the Lord, but you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we ask you to get your belongings, come to the front, and some of our prayer team will pray with you, and we will get that taken care of today. Let next, sometime people gave their lives to the Lord. They spoke with their voice and tongues. They lived for God for a while, but then they got distracted. They got off track, and they began to go back into the world of sinful things. So they, what, what the world called, I mean, what the religious world calls backslid. They gave up on God. So they, now they need to be reunited. They need to be recommitted to walking out a lifestyle that pleases God. If you fell away, if you need to rededicate your life, this is also your time to come. And last but not least, if you need a dynamic church home, one of the best one I ever seen in a popka. <laughs> we invite you to make a known and word family worship center with that dynamic pastor to be your church home. You'll never regret that you did. We'll love on you. We'll teach you. We'll nurture you. We'll make sure in as much as we can that when Jesus breaks those clouds and appears, see, the thing, the thing people don't understand about what's happening for resurrection. When Jesus comes back again, the Bible says when Jesus went up, the apostles watched him as he ascended up into the clouds. And an angel said, this same Jesus you see it going away, he's going to come back in like manner. So he's coming back again. And when he comes, I want to be able to look at him with a smile and know, thank God, I made it. Not thank God, I, I, Lord, do, do I still have time? Because the Bible says it's going to be on a moment and a twinkle of an eye. If you haven't said, Lord, forgive me, come into my heart, how can you get all this work together in a twinkle? A twinkle is just a little glitter. Like, you ever seen a diamond? Somebody raise a hand up and you just get a little glitter, a, a little flash of light? That's how quick Jesus' coming is going to be and take us away. He says, we should not all sleep, but we should be changed in a moment.
and a twinkling of an eye. The dead in Christ, they're going to change first. They're going to be with God before we get there. And then we which remain are going to be caught up with him, the Bible says, in the clouds. This is your time. If you gave your life, give God a praise. If there's one come, if not, take your seats if you can. Let me take your seats. If you gave your life to the Lord out online, we invite you to call us and let us know. We'd be glad to help you, to give you counsel, to direct your good church in your area, or to connect you as an a, 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 a online partner with us. Call us at area code 407 886 4989. We're in our offices from Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. If we miss you, leave a message, and someone from our ministry team will call you back. Also, you can uh, contact us at OAC Ministries at earthlink.net through an email. Go to our website, enter in your search browser, anointedwordfwc.com. Our page will open up. You can see ways to uh, 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 help ministries, read things about our pastors, about our leaders, uh, or you can support us financially with your tithe and offering. You can give two different online ways through our website, through Tithely and Cash App. The prompts are there. You can also send your offerings, your tithes, your gifts, your testimonies, ask your questions through the mail, uh, through sending it to Anointed Word Family Worship Center, Post Office Box 1509, Apopka, Florida, 32704. Put your return address on your envelope. Last but not least, you can come and be where the table of the Lord is being spread and the feast is going on right here in the sanctuary. While the, while, the, while the blessings of God are coming down, you can be here and, and put your uh, offering in the local, uh, envelope, per, offering envelope personally. You can watch messages just like these and be a part of this worship every Thursday and every Sunday. Now, we can watch, actually get us on YouTube and on Facebook. You know, on Thursdays we come on, uh, uh, with, we're here with, with uh, prayer at 715, praise and worship 730, the dynamic word coming at 8. On Sundays, we're here with prayer at 1015, 1030, praise and worship, message coming in at 11. I'm here to tell you there's some great things going on, so catch us on. If you can't be here in the sanctuary, by going to Facebook and, you, excuse me, uh, YouTube and Facebook. Now, in YouTube, you hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. I mean, definitely hit that subscribe button. What it is, subscription button, is just a little red icon that'll pop up on our page. You don't have to give you any personal information, but when you touch it, the more people that touch it and more likes and more things in the nature, then the more times YouTube reposts our message down through the week so we can have a great evangelistic through us. Or you can get us on Facebook. Hit the like button, hit the share button, comment, you know, repost the message down through the week. I saw this past week, many of you reposting Thursday's message. I'm here to tell you that's the best evangelistic tool we have where we can reach people that are not normal in the sanctuary. People, God's doing some great things. Resurrection today is a day for rejoicing and to be happy. And I'm glad that you uh, decided to share it with us and share your heart with Jesus. Now, don't miss the blessing. The empty tomb gave you some benefits. Don't let these benefits go to waste. Give God a praise if you love him.